we have our beautiful assistant minister, Reverend Anne Shand. Reverend Anne. Thank you, Vance and Angela. Good morning, spiritual community. Let me add my own words of welcome to friends in the sanctuary here at Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, Kingston, Jamaica, and to all those joining us in the virtual world of the web. My thoughts this morning are titled Living by Principle. Principle is a word we use a lot in our teaching and loosely in our world of affairs. Our science of mind text authored by Dr. Ernest Holmes forms the basis of the tenets of this teaching that we use to direct our life's journey. And it states in, it, in the glossary, the science of mind is the study of the principle of being, the source or cause from which a thing results, a truth which is unchangeable. In layman's language from the Oxford Pocket Dictionary, principle is a truth or general law that is used as a basis for a theory or system of beliefs. Principles are rules or beliefs governing the way we behave. So to follow from the statements then, the science of mind is a study of the law of being. These truths are unchangeable and they govern the way we behave. Hence we have 13 declaration of principles that govern how and why we behave in the way we do. Behavior usually stems from habits that reveal themselves in the experience of life. In my opinion, New Thought writer Joel Goldsmith has summarized the basis behind our 13 declarations in one sentence. We are called to obey or to realize that there is the law of one power and the law of love, which forms the framework of what and why we behave or believe in what we do say, think, or be. There is only one power, one presence, one, one, one. Vance stated it earlier in the inspirational reading, and I quote, one, one, one. I am God, and there is none else, end of quote. So that is the law of one power. The law of love is from Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39 in the Judeo-Christian Bible. And it says, and I quote, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, end of quote. These two laws, one God and the law of love, we do have an understanding that it is the why of what we believe in the truth of life which set free. These beliefs have so far seemingly dictated how we view life and our ensuing experiences. So as we navigate through serious issues of adversity, we have hope because of these beliefs. And hope is, here is not an anemic response but the hope as stated in Lamentations of the Judeo-Christian Bible. When we recall to mind these beliefs, we have hope. And I quote from Lamentations. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. End of quote. God's faithfulness is always in action, in, through, as each one of us. We stand by that truth. 
So I go back now to the inspirational reading 323 in the textbook. And it says, there's one limitless life, which returns to the thinker exactly what he thinks into it, end of quote. What we think, we outpicture in our lives. This past Youth Sunday, one of our young adults gave her understanding of principle number nine of our declaration, which states, and I quote, we believe that the universal spirit, which is God, operates through a universal mind, which is the law of God, and that we are surrounded by this creative mind, which receives the direct impress of our thought and acts upon it, end of quote. So I now read from her statement of understanding for that particular principle. She says, again, the reminder is the law of God. There's only one God, no matter what each individual calls God, there's only one. We each are operating out of the one mind. That is why when I made the misstep, of forwarding a video that went against my principles, my mom was directed by that one mind to enter my room at the right moment. She was divinely guided to help me make the correct choice because I had chosen not to pay attention to that direct impress which I had received and which I ignored so that I had not to do something I knew was wrong. It created an impact on my mother's part of the universal mind, causing her to come and rescue me from a possible poor decision." End of quote. Out of the mouth of babes. So simply, before she was able to press send, the law of love or divine intervention, you may say, in the form of our mom, stopped that imperfect moment from escalating. Here's a young adult who under normal circumstances understand right from possible or seeming wrong decisions. She courted a decision that was not in alignment with who she was. But at that moment, assistance came through her mom to bring balance in keeping with the natural order of life. How many times in our lives and affairs, the fear of something other than good looms so large in our mind, knotting us into cords of anxiety? And then the hand of light or divine intervention dissolves the condition because of our courage and resilience to continue to think only good in the face of what confronted us. Dr. Holmes in a statement, and I quote, says, in spite of all conditions, the race believes more in good than in evil. Otherwise, it would not continue to exist. This is the eternal hope and sense in our life, end of quote. Hard-hitting Emmett Fox states, and I quote, the world is not going to the dogs. The human race is not doomed. Civilization is not going to crash. The captain is on the bridge. Humanity is going through a difficult time. But humanity has gone through difficulties many times before in its past history. And it has always come through strengthened and purified. End of quote. So how do we continuously live by principle that enables us to truly live in a state of grace that covered that young adult and every time that divine intervention heals, protects, guides, and prospers us even when we mess up. How do we ensure that we do not allow 
the imperfection of the uncomfortable in the events, the adversities and disabilities of life, life to, to soak all, all our perceptions, perceptions and subvert, and subvert the, natural the natural path to experience our life's journey, journey in a stable, consistent, and satisfactory manner. What does living by principle have to do with the above? I go back to that reading that Vance gave us earlier. There is one limitless life which returns to the thinker exactly what he thinks into it. So, what we think, we experience. We have always, in the midst of the issues that confront us, the matters that concern us, to take the opportunity to reverse the mental concepts that outpicture into situations we do not like or no longer wish to experience. In the moment of redemption, that little sliver there of light, something opens the way for the law to act upon the new impress of our thoughts for a new experience. Trout reminds us that if our method of using the law in the past have brought us sorrow, fear, trouble. We have only to fall back on the law. That if we reverse the cause, the effects will be reversed too. The sincere endeavor to act up to our new mental attitude is essential. For we cannot really think in one way and act in another end of quote. So how do we keep our eye on the prize? Always using every moment, perfect or imperfect, as golden opportunities to grow. How do we place ourselves in this lifestyle that must contribute to enhancing our movement upwards and onwards in claiming a life more abundant? Yes, we have spiritual practices that form the bedrock of our progressive shaping of our consciousness to outpicture to that which is of beauty, that which is good, and that which is true. There are additional pathways that we can pursue to enhance our entire perfect experience of life. I am reminded by Kintsugi, the Japanese art of putting broken pottery pieces back together with gold. It is described as a metaphor for embracing our flaws and imperfections so we can create an even stronger, more beautiful way of living. It is an art. Kumai, in the book, Japanese Art of Wellness, Nourish Mind, Body, and Spirit, uses the Kintsugu back path to charter a new way of life. Kintsugu, that's what it's called. The book further states that every break is unique. And instead of repairing an item like new, the 400-year-old technique actually highlights the scars as part of the design. Using this as a metaphor healing ourselves, it teaches an important lesson. So sometimes in the process of repairing things that have been broken, we create something more unique, beautiful, and resilient. Specifically in cases where there is loss, for instance, jobs, relationships, health, it is especially relevant to reframe oneself, not as a victim of circumstances, but by becoming, remember that word Reverend John used in his encouragement last week, by becoming something victorious, stronger, courageous, resilient, accessing that inner potential, but leaving behind what no longer serves us. And to come into an awareness of a total lifestyle that nourishes the body, the mind, and the spirit. The first pathway of Kintsugu is called Wabi Sabi 
Wabi means Japanese for alone, and Sabi means passage of time, which is simply over the passage of time. One learns to embrace every aspect of life's unfolding, whatever the label we place on our seeming imperfections. It is all part of the symmetry of life. We celebrate everything in that perfect pattern of harmony and conformity to the order of the universe. Celebration automatically changes the mindset. The shift from despair to striving for the best that encompasses spirit's highest idea of the self. The next pathway is called Gaman. Japanese for the ability to endure, to be patient, and to be calm. One practices Gaman by going into the silence, meditation, and visualization, all spiritual principles and practices that we are all aware of. But Gaman also focuses on courting the breath. Same breathe with me which provides the golden opportunity to remain focused on our inner potential of wisdom to be guided accordingly in all circumstances. Our inner potential to experience joy instead of sadness. Our inability to create something new rather than staying in, in the inertia of our discomfort. Once we remain focused on the art of breathing, into that limitless life without distraction from the exterior, exterior world. We build up our resilience. We give the mind shutter a break in order to embrace the best idea of ourselves. So as you take time to breathe in your beautiful self, imperfections as some people say, what's and all, we come to that awareness that we are God in action and we have control over our life. Measured breathing. That is what Gaman is all about. The, the third pathway is called Yui Mari. It's spelled Y-U-I-M-E-R-I. Japanese, I, I mean, my son taught me Japanese. He did Japanese for his degree. Mm. Which means care for our inner circle. Under Kitsugi, the practice of valuing togetherness is one of the high points of this way of being. But Yui Marie specifically deals with healing through the strength and nourishment of one's inner circle of family, friends, and spiritual community, I might add. During the period of vulnerability, of healing and reframing, the inner circle assists in realizing, accepting, and nourishing the individual. But they stay true to themselves in an atmosphere of love, acceptance, and non-judgment. Gentle reminders of love even when the individual does not want to speak or to be close to anyone. It is a time of deep understanding, which means even when one may not be understanding what is occurring in the deep inner recesses of the mind of the individual. We still allow love to give a smile, a greeting, even when it is not welcomed. That is what nourishment from a non-judgment stance means. Albert Schweitzer, noted humanitarian, tells the story of a flock of wild geese that had settled to rest on a pond. One of the flock had been captured by a gardener who had clipped its wings before releasing it. When the geese started to resume their flight, this one tried frantically and vainly to lift itself in the air. The others observing his struggles flew about in obvious efforts to encourage him. But it was of no use. Thereupon, the entire flock settled back on the pond and waited, even though the urge to go on was strong within them. For several days, they waited until the damaged feather had grown sufficiently to permit the goose to fly. Meanwhile, 
the unethical gardener, having been converted by the ethical geese, gladly watched them as they finally rose and all resumed their long flight. Geese who practice nourishment of each other. More or less, what about us? The inner circle of our love and friends and our community to nourish each other. Friends, that is what Yuri Marie is all about. It is not what is said that is important. It is the feeling of genuine belonging, acceptance, respect, and fellowship that nourishes the mind and spirit. The inner circle provides nourishment until the individual can truly nourish itself. We move through the kids' saga pathways, building up on each step, starting from the inner reframing of one's mental attitudes by the celebration of imperfections as part of the self in a positive manner, allowing the transformation of mindset through patience and calmness, tapping into the inner resources of strength and wisdom, which was already part of us anyway, but just need to be revealed and come forth to the service. All this is happening under the loving, watchful eyes of the inner circle who provide love and compassion. This process continues until the individual awakens to true self-love, which now facilitates the reconnection and deepening of all relationships, thereby leading to the balancing and strengthening of the emotional well-being of the individual. We move to the fourth pathway, which is Ayoshoka, which is nourishing the body by active self-care. This encompasses all aspects of self-care. Even the food that you place in your bodies, it's taken with care, it's cooked with love. We reframe our body temple by whatever means. That is the clothing, the exercise, whatever is necessary that moves us to that feeling of being loved and cosseted when you really feel good about yourself into that supreme sense of well-being, as Courtney would say. This leads us to the final discipline, which is cancer, which is called the cultivation of sincere gratitude. When one truly realizes that everything that concerns us has a blessing somewhere in it, then whatever we possess, materially, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, we must give thanks for. We are here to fulfill that purpose of evolving into our true selves. And that is natural for us. It is said that when we practice gratitude, we let go of the fantasies and the ego trips, and we now reframe new neural networks that facilitate experiences of the new and the extraordinary. All is deemed precious. Nothing is wasted in the transforming of lives and ultimately the environment which we all live in and share. So as in the Kitsugo art, which supports the holistic development of ourselves internally and externally, we come to recognize that the seeming imperfections are golden gifts that are to be revealed and cherished in living a life of principle. And we are reminded again from that inspirational reading, all is love, yet all is law. Love is the impelling force and law executes the will of love. Man is a center of God consciousness in the great whole. He cannot deface his real being, but may hinder the whole from coming into complete expression into his life. But turning to the one with complete abandonment and in absolute trust, he will find that he's already saved, healed, and prospered. Friends, the captain is on the bridge of our lives. So let us rest on that certainty. 
Let us say yes to living a life of principle and let the best flow into our experiences. Could you please join me in this affirmation? I say yes to my good. Together, I say yes to my good. Namaste. Namaste.